Good evening, everybody. Good to be with you on this beautiful Lord's Day evening. Please turn in your Bibles to Romans chapter 3. We'll begin there in just a moment. Romans chapter 3, if you will. Thank you for visiting with us. If you're one of our visitors, we invite you back any time that you have the opportunity. And as we always like to make a mention of, we appreciate any questions that you may have about why we do certain things, uh, why we say certain things of that nature. We, we would love to get in, involved in a Bible study with you. As most of you know, I was in uh, Missouri recently for a gospel meeting. I told you how fulfilling it was and how uplifting uh, and encouraging it was. The members really got out and they supported the meeting. Uh, the majority of them were there every single night. But the, the most encouraging thing to me about that meeting was that there was visitors from the community there every single night that were not members of the Lord's Church. And one of them really hit it off, he and I. Uh, his name was Garrett. Name is Garrett. Um, we're about the same age as one another, and we're at the same point of life. We haven't been married very long. Vera and I have been married for about four years now, and he has a young boy, so do I. And by the end of the meeting, he and I had had kind of a, a relationship, at least I thought of it that way, and I got to go over to his house, and we spent a couple hours studying the Bible together. He was one of the most refreshing seekers of truth I have ever met, and that is not an exaggeration. These are his words. These are not my words, and these are not words I got out of a book, though they will sound like it. He said, I am looking for the church that abides in the apostolic traditions and teachings. I mean, what more could you say to a preacher than that? I mean, that's like saying sickum <laughs> to a dog. Uh, to a bone, you know, I just, I'm ready to study, let's do this. He was bouncing around from denomination to denomination trying to find the church, in his words, that abided in the, in the apostolic traditions and teachings. He had mainly a Baptist background. And to put it quite frankly, he got kicked out of the last Baptist denomination that he was with because they didn't like the fact that he was questioning their ideas and what they were teaching and the practices and he said it was so refreshing when he got to the, to the Church of Christ there in Butler, Missouri. A 90-some-year-old lady who was in a nursing home, he happened to, to work at the nursing home, invited him. It reminded me of that, that story when I heard Ryan's lesson this morning about what we can do as older people. There she was, a widow of umpteen years, in her 90s, inviting someone. He comes. There is always work that we can do. So he came, and he said that it was the most refreshing experience over the last couple of months that he had been going there. People welcomed his questions. He had been studying with two or three people at a time. He just couldn't get enough. But he had a hang-up with the church there, and with me, really. And that's what the lesson is based on. His hang-up was this, how we teach baptism. His view on baptism is one of the most unique views I have ever come across. I've never come across this particular view personally, though I've seen it in writing, magazines, and books. People describe that this, this view is out there. Let me describe in, in, in a short time, because our study was two hours, so I'm going to try to condense his view down. His view was this, that you are saved prior to baptism. But he was so staunchly convicted that, that baptism was a command that he said that if you refuse baptism, you have in fact fallen away from grace. Now you might say, well, that's a little weird. How could somebody be so convicted that it's a necessity that somebody do that and yet say, well, it, it, it doesn't happen before you're, before you're saved? Well, his view was this. You're saved by grace when you believe, then you're baptized and his view hinged on one parallel, and it is this. That New Testament baptism is the equivalent, is the exact parallel to Old Testament circumcision. So the view goes like this. Abraham was justified. He was saved. Righteousness was counted to Abraham. And then he received the sign of circumcision. And so he said, 
that it's that way in the New Testament, that you're saved, then you are baptized, which is the Old Testament version of, you know, circumcision. And he said if you refuse that, like any Jew would have refused circumcision, that you would have fallen away from grace. And he cited a couple of instances in the Old Testament where God was angry with the fact that somebody had not circumcised their child, that, that, that the covenant relationship was no longer there. He defended the view rather intelligently. And although we're going to study many different things along the lines of baptism and circumcision, I, I want to look at this parallel and answer this question. Are they an exact parallel? But before we answer that question, we need to get it down that Abraham was in fact justified prior to his circumcision. Uh, and that's why we're here in Romans chapter 3 and 4. Back up, I think I said to turn to Romans chapter 4, but look at Romans chapter 3, verses 29 and 30. Or is God the God of the Jews only? Is he not the God of Gentiles also? Yes, of Gentiles also. Since God is one who will justify the circumcised by faith and the uncircumcised through faith. I have made a mention of this uh, recently over the last couple of months in my sermons that one of the great problems in the Lord's church when it first began was what to do about the Gentiles. The Jews have been circumcising their kids now, the, the boys, on the eighth day for centuries, thousands of years now. And they took pride in that. There was something about that that they could pride themselves about, that at least they thought that. And so when the Gentiles were coming into the Lord's church and they were converting Gentiles, this was a big question. What are we going to do about this? Are we going to command them? Should we compel them to be circumcised? And the plain answer that, that the New Testament gives is no, we're not going to compel them to do that. And Paul says here in verse 30 that God is going to justify the circumcised just like he's going to justify the uncircumcised. And Paul's argument in chapter 4 is this. We Jews should have known this all along. For Abraham was justified prior to his circumcision. Drop down to chapter 4, verse 10, if you will. Verse 10 of chapter 4. How then was it counted to him? That is, righteousness being counted to Abraham. How then was it counted to him? Was it before or after he had been circumcised? That's the million dollar question right there. Was righteousness counted to Abraham before or after? He says in the latter part of verse 10, it was not after, but before he was circumcised. He received the sign of circumcision as a seal of the righteousness that he had by faith. I want you to underline that term in your mind. He received it as a seal, because we're going to come back to what is our seal later on in this sermon. So Abraham received it as a seal of the righteousness that he had by faith. While he was still uncircumcised, the purpose was to make him the father of all who believe without being circumcised, so that righteousness would be counted to them as well. So in verse 10, he asked the question, when did this happen? When did, when did Abraham get justification? When was righteousness counted to him? Was it before or after? And it was before. He received it later. And verse 11, he specifies what that circumcision represented. It represented the seal that he, of the righteousness that he already had, of the justification that he already had. So... You see how his view goes then, going back to Garrett in our Bible study. If baptism and Old Testament circumcision are an exact parallel, if they are, he's right. That justification happens prior to baptism. But it all hinges on whether or not they are an exact parallel. Well, here's the question. Is the parallel ever made in Scripture? Okay, we know that the silence of Scripture does not authorize a thing. I, I could compare baptism to anything in the Old Testament. The, the destruction of Sodom and Gomorrah, the 70 years of captivity. I could compare baptism to incense, and none of those things would really make any sense. But does the Scripture actually make the parallel? And the passage where people think that it is made, and I specify on the board there that people think this, is Colossians chapter 2. Turn in your Bibles, please, to Colossians chapter 2. And I say that they think this because I don't see it. The imagery of something being cut off and thrown away, that imagery is there. But the parallel of what that represented and what New Testament baptism represents, that parallel specifically is not there. Beginning read, reading with me in verse 8, 
See to it that no one takes you captive by philosophy and empty deceit, according to tradition, human tradition, according to the elemental spirits of the world, and not according to Christ. Stick to Christ. I love verse 8. Verse 8 is one of those preacher verses. You know, it just, it preaches itself. It's so easy to preach this. Don't let any philosopher, PhD, come along thinking that they've got it better than Christ. Stick to Christ. Why would you do that? Verse 9, for in him the whole fullness of deity dwells bodily. That was never said of any philosopher, but that is said of Jesus Christ. That the fullness of deity, verse 10, and you have been filled in him who is the head of all rule and authority. In him also you were circumcised with the circumcision made without hands by putting off the body of the flesh by the circumcision of Christ, having been buried with him in baptism, in which you were also raised with him through faith in the powerful working of God who raised him from the dead. Verse 13, And you, who were dead in your trespasses and the uncircumcision of your flesh, God made alive together with him, having forgiven us all our trespasses. It does mention circumcision, doesn't it? But where does it actually mention Old Testament circumcision? Where does it compare the purpose of that circumcision to the purpose of New Testament baptism? If you look closely, I think because the imagery is there of something being cut off and thrown away, that the imagery is there, that people have automatically made them parallels in purpose. What I see is this. In him you were circumcised with the circumcision made without hands. That's mentioned. But where is the circumcision with hands mentioned? The circumcision of Jesus Christ is mentioned. But where is the circumcision of an eight-year-old or eight-day-old boy mentioned? And finally, the uncircumcision of your flesh. That is the carnality of, uh, of how you've been living. The fleshly desires, your fleshly way of life. You were dead in that. This is all mentioned. But these two questions are important. Where does the passage bring up Old Testament circumcision? And where, where does the text say that baptism does for us what it did for Abraham or the Jews of old? Where is that parallel? I don't see it. If there is any Old Testament circumcision that is being paralleled to baptism... My argument would be this one right here. In Deuteronomy chapter 30 and verse 6, he said, And the Lord your God will circumcise your heart. One of my pet peeves when, when we study the Old Testament is we say things about the Old Testament sometimes that leave the wrong impression. Like the Old Testament was all about physical things. Was it really? And we say about the New Testament sometimes that it's all spiritual. And that's in fact one of the arguments against baptism. That it's all spiritual and literal water is not necessary. Well, how about literal fruit of the vine or literal unleavened bread? You see, sometimes when we group these into generalities that the Old Testament was all physical and the New Testament's all spiritual, we need to be very careful. But I would, I would suggest that if any circumcision in Colossians chapter 2 is being brought up, it would be this one right here. Furthermore, I would go as far as to say that Colossians chapter 2 highlights the differences rather than the similarities of the circumcision that Abraham represented or that he received. Let's go one step further. Let's say that we all were willing to admit that baptism and circumcision are not paralleled in the Scripture as far as the purpose. The purpose is the key. Does the, does the New Testament ever say that baptism does for us what circumcision did for Abraham? And that's why I had you underline the word seal in Romans chapter 4 and verse 11. Remember that? that he received circumcision as a seal. So, my question is this. Does the Bible ever refer to baptism as a seal of the righteousness that somebody has or the justification that they've received? A seal of the forgiveness of sins that they've already had? And I've done the research, though I, I encourage everybody to do it for yourself. The answer is no. 
that the Bible never refers to baptism as a seal. And that's not to say that the New Testament doesn't have a good bit to say about seals. I would say this, that if we do have a seal, it is the sealing of the Holy Spirit. Read these passages with me. In Ephesians chapter 1, verse 13, In Him you also, when you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, and believed in Him, were sealed with the promised Holy Spirit. So Abraham received circumcision as the seal of the justification that he already had. And in Ephesians chapter 1 and verse 13, he doesn't say that baptism is the seal. He says the promised Holy Spirit is your seal. Ephesians chapter 4 and verse 30, Do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God by whom you were sealed for the day of redemption. Again, seal for Abraham was circumcision. What is it here? The Holy Spirit of God. And lastly, 2 Corinthians chapter 1 and verse 22. And who has put his seal on us and given us his spirit in our hearts as a guarantee. You can interpret this text, this last one that I put up on the board. That he put his seal on us and then separately that he gave us his spirit in our hearts. But if you interpret it in light of Ephesians chapter 1 and Ephesians chapter 4, that's not a correct interpretation, is it? The correct interpretation would be he gave the Holy Spirit in our hearts as the seal. Brian taught a lesson, taught two lessons about the Holy Spirit. So any, any questions about the Holy Spirit, I'm going to direct to Brian. <laughs> Thank you for doing that, Brian, after, after the lesson. But in all seriousness, there's a lot of people in the Lord's church who don't believe that the Holy Spirit is given in our hearts, like 2 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 22 says. I remember talking to a girlfriend that I had who was here in the valley. It was before I met you, honey. I promise. <laughs> and she grew up here in the valley with a preacher who was staunch against any sort of indwelling whatsoever. And one of the questions that she had to me was, well, how could you sin and have the, have the Holy Spirit? And that's one of the, the things that the preacher said was a reason why, why we can't have the indwelling of the Holy Spirit because we sin. Remember King Saul? When the Holy Spirit came over King Saul while he was in sin... And it came over him so powerfully, some of the people of that time questioned, is, is Saul numbered among one of the prophets? Remember Caiaphas, the high priest, who prophesied by the Spirit and yet was condemning Jesus to death? King David? So, does the Spirit just leave people and then come back and leave people and come back? I don't see that. So what's our seal? It's the Spirit. If, if anything is going to be paralleled as far as the purpose of circumcision and our seal, it's got to be that. And yet, after we've done all of this piecing together, you know what we're really doing? We're just saying what Acts 2.38 says. Go in your Bibles to Acts chapter 2 uh, and verse 38. I, I know that you know the passage, and we've quoted it a million and one times and you've heard it read a million and one times, but I want you to see it with fresh eyes. I can't stand when the inspiration of the apostles is attacked. It normally is attacked when, when, when talking about the inspiration of the New Testament and their, their letters to the churches. But if there was ever a time when it is, it is, it is of the most utmost ridiculousness to, to attack the inspiration of the apostles, it would be this day. For it says in the beginning part of Acts chapter 2 that they spoke as the Spirit gave them utterance. This is what the Holy Spirit says. We oftentimes quote this as Peter's first sermon or the Apostles' first sermon, but it was more literally the Holy Spirit's first sermon. And after he got done preaching, this is what he says in verse 38. And Peter said to them, Repent, and each of you be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for what? Why would you repent and be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ? For the forgiveness of sins, and you will receive the gift of what? Your seal. I'm obviously implementing that based on the passages. 
that we've read from Ephesians chapter 1 and Ephesians chapter 4 and 2 Corinthians 1. You repent, you are baptized in the name of Jesus, you receive justification, the forgiveness of sins, righteousness is accounted to you, and then you receive your seal. That is more in line with what Abraham received, is it not? And I'm not splitting hairs. I hope nobody thinks that we're splitting hairs as far as when we receive a seal and when we don't. This is a matter of our justification, brethren. You know, how could we ever say that we're confident of our salvation if we don't know exactly when justification came upon us in Christ? I want to spend the rest of the sermon making an argument for baptism. I know that 95% of, we got the home team here on Sunday nights, 95% of you agree with the scripture, we're on the same page as far as what baptism is for, but I hope that this strengthens your faith because baptism is constantly attacked as, do, as nothing but uh, just another work of men and people compare it all the time to just another work of law. And we need to be able to give an intelligent defense for what we believe. But thirdly, the purpose of this lesson is for the 5% of you who maybe have never been baptized or you're on the fence. I hope this serves as a nudge. Three times, the scripture refers to somebody being put into Jesus Christ. Now, the scripture has a lot to say about being in Christ, the blessings of being in Christ, the beauty of being in Christ. But only three times does the scripture ever say or specify when a person is put into Jesus Christ and guess what's mentioned in all three times you guessed it baptism here they are Romans chapter 6 and verse 3 do you not know that all of us who have been baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into the death of Jesus into his death for by one spirit this is 1 Corinthians 12 and verse 13 for in one spirit we were all baptized into one body. Now that doesn't say baptized into Christ. But that's why I put in parentheses in verse 27, the text specifies that the body under consideration, the body in the context, is the body of Jesus Christ. In one spirit we were all baptized into the body of Jesus Christ. And lastly, Galatians chapter 3 and verse 27, For as many of you as were baptized into Christ have put on Jesus Christ. You've clothed yourself with Christ. That is tremendous evidence to me that baptism is absolutely essential for your salvation. For if you were to say that salvation came before baptism and you understood that baptism is into Christ, you know what the conclusion would be? Listen to me very closely. The conclusion is you can be saved apart from Jesus Christ. Is that not the necessary conclusion? You carry that argument out? So let's put it back into the realm of circumcision. If circumcision is an exact parallel and baptism is into Christ, again, that means you can be saved apart from Jesus? Does anyone believe that? I won't believe it. I can't believe it. Based on what the New Testament teaches me. I've studied this with people who a light bulb has come on. They've wanted to be baptized that very hour. And I've studied this with people and it just went right off their back. But if you care about being in Jesus Christ, I, I don't understand how you could just ignore this evidence. That that's when somebody is put into Jesus Christ. Now I want to go back to Colossians chapter 2. Go back there if you will. Because we really didn't we really didn't make the point as strongly as we should as far as what Paul was talking about. We we made the point of what Paul was not talking about that he didn't bring up the purpose of Old Testament circumcision. But the imagery of something being cut off, I don't want to get too graphic here, but extra skin being cut off thrown in the trash, that imagery is being brought up to say that God is operating on us. He's cutting off our sins 
and throwing it in the trash. Look back at verse 11. In him you were circumcised where? By the way, in where were you circumcised? In him, right? And where did we study where, that what... Where do we get into Christ? When do we get into Christ? In baptism, right? So it all, it all makes sense. It all fits together. In Him, you were also circumcised with a circumcision made without hands by putting off the body of the flesh by the circumcision of Jesus Christ, having been buried with Him in baptism. Friends, we have a serious problem in the Lord's church with confidence in salvation. I find a lot more Christians walking around with doubt and worries about Am I going to be saved? Is this going to happen to me in Judgment Day? But if we understand that God has operated on us, and just like they took that foreskin and they tossed it in the trash, you know where our old sins are when we've been baptized into Jesus Christ? They're in the trash! And when God operates, He does a pretty good job of operating. You're not going to take some sin and leave some there. And he's not going to call the memory what's been tossed in the trash. So the, the imagery is powerful. And it should give us the confidence of what God has done for us in Jesus Christ when we were baptized into Him. Please get out your songbooks and turn to the Song of Invitation. If you've never been baptized into Jesus Christ, I hope and I pray, I have been praying this week about this lesson, that it would serve as a, as a little nudge. And whether you do it tonight or whether you do it at midnight, I hope you do it. Because there's a judgment day coming. And the proof of that has already been given in the resurrection of Jesus Christ. He has fixed a day in which He will judge the world in righteousness having furnished proof to all men by raising Jesus from the dead. Can you imagine standing before Jesus and giving a defense, having known what the Scripture says about baptism, having to give a defense for why you weren't baptized? I couldn't imagine it. Be saved tonight. Will you come? As together we stand and sing.